Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, once again, uh, good morning, uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to thank you so much uh, for joining for this um, uh, uh, webinar <coughs> on publishing in the uh, IMBAT journals. Um, so we did recognize that uh, uh, it's important, you know, to for one to know which journals to target, uh, which is a very important aspect when it comes to issues of rating and so forth, and also to have your work, you know, to have a high impact. Uh, yesterday we had a workshop with NRF, and what they emphasized much now is for one to be rated, your work should be having an impact. If your work is not making an impact, chances of you being rated are slim. So I think it's something which is very, very important for us to take note of. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the presence of our dean. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, without uh, uh, wasting much of our time, uh, I will leave time to our guest speaker here. Our guest speaker is none other than Prof. Tiamrindi, uh, whom I would regard as a distinguished academic who is uh, doing quite a lot of work, is a rated uh, researcher, uh, uh, full professor in the Department of Management uh, <clears throat> within the Faculty of Management and Commerce. He served as a, a co-chair with the South African Young Academic of Science. Uh, there is quite a lot on his profile, which if I'm to go through, you know, uh, it would spend the whole day. So. <clears throat> I'll share with you, colleagues on the chat there, uh, about his profile, and we can uh, check on it uh, on our own, uh, <clears throat> given that we've got a limited time here. So, Prof, without much ado, I'll leave this time to you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Kapingura, and I hope everybody can um, hear me uh, We're loud and clear. Um, thank you to the faculty uh, through the Dean for um, conscientizing us to the importance of this workshop uh, and also the, the desire and wish that they had that we organize such a workshop uh, for uh, not only our internal members, but also for um, uh, external members who are also here, which I would also uh, acknowledge. I will make available the presentation um, to the colleagues, so please don't worry about uh, if you miss anything, uh, including all the readings that are there. There are some readings that are there which I we will not read, but uh, will form part of the, uh, the, 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 the presentation. So I would like to begin uh, also by stating that I think it's very important for academics to have conversations like the one that we're going to have uh, this morning about the importance of publishing. I think it forms quite an important part of the work that we do. It, uh, it is a way that distinguishes uh, us uh, amongst ourselves. It is also a way that is a useful feeder, if you ask me, to um, interventions that are much needed in society. Uh, for them to be coming through the platform of uh, the work that we do, the research that we do. In other words, we are not, we don't do research or conduct research for um, the benefit which could be monetary that can come with it, but we're also doing research to try and find ways to uh, make better the experiences of the different types of people that um, our constituencies may be serving. I think this becomes important because a lot of us miss that point. Um, it, we miss that point because what we try to do is we try to reduce research uh, to what is it that I can benefit instead of asking questions around what is it that others can benefit. Now, there is an important power dynamic that is at stake here. And the important power dynamic really then puts us as academics, researchers, at our different levels that we are in a position of privilege. Because the position of privilege uh, is really uh, dictated by the fact that the currency that uh, we are 
uh, exchanging value with is the currency of knowledge. And because it's the currency of knowledge, those that have the knowledge and the, uh, are, are distinguished from those that don't have the knowledge. I'll give you a good example. If you go to a, a, a public facility and um, um, someone starts to make a scene about, let's say, service which is not being rendered, and then they start quoting things that they know. Well, according to the Batopele principle, you as um, <clears throat> public servants need to be serving everybody that is here. By virtue of that happening, what starts to happen is that uh, people start to listen because this person is using the privilege that they have to actually communicate and, inform, and, and inform the other parties of whatever rights that they, 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 they may be having. And I think that's, that's, foundation, that's fundamental and also important. <clears throat> we will make the presentation available. We want to talk about publishing. And I am going to begin, uh, and this is the outline. It's not a hectic outline. Uh, we're going to talk about first the issues that I believe are shaping the context of publishing that are affecting you and uh, me um, uh, because of the terrain that we're operating in. And it's not just a terrain which is um, local. It's a terrain which is also international. It's a terrain which is also regional. So we do workshops on the African continent. We were in Rwanda a few weeks ago. We were in Zambia and we'll be in Zimbabwe soon. One of the things we pick up is that some of the issues that we're going to pick up under the section around the issues shaping the publishing context are issues that are affecting academics world over. Perhaps maybe in our context, we may have um, some points of privilege where we have a little bit of privilege uh, that we have, which is you know, different from other scholars elsewhere in the world. And that would be critical to look at. We're also going to uh, ask the question, why should we publish? Some of you are leaders in departments and so forth. Why should we be, uh, or in the institution, following up and making sure that people are publishing? And then we then unpack also the, the popular mantra, um, uh, publish or perish. And then what then is the core of the presentation is what then constitutes impact factor. Um, I have taken uh, some notes from a webinar I attended run by a leading publisher, Elsevier, which I'll be uh, using for me and I've put the source there so that you'll be able to follow. And then we're going to look at some um, uh, titles, not just management and commerce, but in general, you could, uh, we're from different disciplines. We could even uh, talk about the different areas that we're from and how it affects the work that we're doing. So I want to propose to you seven considerations that I find very interesting within the South African context around which um, um, we, we are all affected. Uh, these are from salient South African studies. What, what I've done is I've also saved the studies so we can email uh, with the slides the, the different papers that are there. And I'll be commenting on each and every one of these papers and trying to unpack how these are salient issues that are shaping the context of publishing in our, in our, in our, in our um, experiences and what we're going through. The first point I want to uh, mention is that publishing um, is a way to be welcomed to the academic sphere. Now, there's an interesting uh, paper here by an author, I think from UKZN, uh, Zulu, um, in the South African Journal of Higher Education. And one of the findings, apology, the fine print in the picture is, the, 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 the text is, is rather uh, small, but I'll read it to you. I've highlighted it. The findings show two main challenges encountered, especially by black women professors, notably feelings of being unwelcomed within the academic space and undermined in their teaching positions. Now, I want to propose to you that through the work that we do in the publishing space, um, uh, in, in the articles that we write. Basically, we are also part of this um, process of orientation to this academic world, and I, I call it the academic sphere that we operate in. This simply means that the validation that we are going to get as scholars uh, in the different disciplines that we are in is largely dependent on the nature of the contribution that our work is going to make. Now, this is crucial because you are likely not going to get a lot of validation 
if all of the work that you're doing is merely repeating what others have done. Now, there, there's, there's a point to be said here because you often hear when uh, students are preparing for presentations, PhD, colloquia, and all of that, um, they, they often make the argument. Um, a study has been done uh, in New York and another one in France and another one, but no such study has been done in an African context. Now, what, what that presupposes is that you are seeking to be welcomed into the body of knowledge by saying, well, yes, these are the findings others have found, but no such study has been done within an African context. Therefore, because nobody has done such a study within the African context, please welcome me to the club. And unfortunately, that's not how it works. Um, the, the, the study by Zulu here in the South African Journal of Higher Education merely reminds us all that by virtue of us signing to be in this um, academic world and academic sphere, as I call it, we are also pushing and positioning ourselves, either uh, hoping to be welcomed to this through the work that we do. We're not being welcomed by how pleasant our smiles are or the personas that we have. The work that we do, and this places importance on publishing, is, is going to be crucial in determine, determining this welcome or being unwelcomed, um, as in the case of this paper by Zulu. Quite, quite interesting. Would you read that paper? The second point, we are also witnessing a shift in how we measure impact. If you compare when probably I wrote my first ever paper from my master's study, which I finished in 2007, the study, but the paper only got published in 2010 because I was still navigating through to try and get that paper through. We didn't have ORCID numbers then, and we'll talk about that later on. We didn't have as much fancy metrics as we do now. We didn't have platforms like the conversation. We didn't have uh, platforms like ResearchGate. We didn't have platforms like academia.edu. We didn't have LinkedIn and all these uh, wonderful online platforms that are there. But within the passing of time, we are now seeing uh, the measuring of impact being not only prioritized, but there's a lot of talk about bibliometrics which is uh, quite interesting because this is just the audit trail that you, your work leaves um, uh, uh, from um, the work that you're doing. Um, and that's fascinating because uh, the trick now is not a trick of just having the ORCID number. The trick is about finding ways of making sure that your work is gaining visibility because the, the impact that your work is going to receive is dependent on also this digital footprint that uh, is happening and how it actually arrives to uh, the crucial people. And remember the first point about being welcomed or unwelcomed. Now, in this paper in the South African Journal of Higher Education, these colleagues, I think they're... Um, uh, uh, looking, they were looking at uh, the publishing bibliometrics. Listen to one of the uh, salient issues that they argued. Bibliometrics have utility as part of the assessment of academic output, but may be subject to time-dependent bias. And I think that's crucial. That's crucial because it would be unfair of me to say and set it in stone that uh, the usage of those bibliometrics is the best way forward. This is also subject to bias. I want to give you a, a good example. Uh, a, a few weeks ago uh, at the University of Fort Hare, we, we, we lost a very prolific scholar in uh, Dr. Mdaka, uh, who was brilliant in the language of Isikosa uh, and even promoting the, 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 the teaching and the instruction of Isikosa. Now, what was fascinating about his work is that his work would probably not have received as much prominence in platforms like ResearchGate uh, because of the medium in which the work is portrayed. Yes, he could have written a few papers in 
uh, English and so forth. But what we also need to also then uh, uh, do away from some of the metrics that we measure people on is to try and also understand the context in which a particular scholar is operating within. And I think it's important for the people in the languages because uh, the, the metrics may not work in their, in their way. Research quality is best measured. Now, again, this is their viewpoint. They use the word best measured. Again, that's a subjective thing using the H index, the G index, and the M index. Uh, all, all I can say about this is, is I don't think that's true. I think uh, those indexes uh, play an important part in telling us what um, uh, should be happening. But they do not tell us so much about uh, and, and should not be set in stone as a, a complete measure of the totality of what a scholar is all about. And that's, that's what the criticism in much of these um, uh, papers is, is about. So bibliometrics that account for time, such as the M index, should be considered in the early identification of young researchers. I agree. I really think that if you're going to sit as a promotion panel or a panel within an institution to assess a scholar's work, I think the time dimension needs to feature. The time dimension because the turnaround time in, in publications and so forth differs from person to person um, and from discipline to discipline. So I was mentioning that the first paper I wrote, it took me two years to write that paper from the time of finishing my master's. And then it only got published at the latter part of 2010. So um, uh, if we are serious about measuring the contribution of fellow scholars in the field. We must also be serious in using metrics that do not disadvantage people, but are also subject to the notion of time so that we, we don't measure everybody the same way. And I think that's a crucial thing I took from this paper. Number three, publishing um, has now become, um, see I've got two screens here. I'm still on number two. Please just confirm we're on the, the, the number three. Prof Kapingura? Yes, yes Prof. Yes, okay. yes, number yeah. three. My other screen here is saying number two, so I, I don't know uh, what's going on. But anyway, it's fine. We are um, looking at number three. Number three, thank you. Yes. Publishing is a vehicle for your profession. Now, whether you like it or not, uh, the, the 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 how when we started we got told that it's a four-legged chair, uh, publishing, teaching, community engagement, and university service. So publishing is an important part of uh, and a, a vehicle which uh, can potentially help you in going forward in the spheres that you are seeking to establish yourself as a scholar. Now, this was an interesting paper again from the South African Journal of Higher Education, um, uh, which was now looking at the aspects of research excellence, particularly from uh, the notion of early career researchers. Now, a, a takeaway there, within academia, a form of validation is needed in terms of how individual academic capability through how much you are publishing, not so much, uh, not, not through how much you are publishing, but now we are now realizing it's not so much about how much you are publishing, but is what are you publishing and what is the impact of that? So two academics met at a, at a water point in a university department and they started bragging and boasting. The one academic says that, so how many pub publications did you have uh, the previous year? And the one says, no, I had uh, only 10 publications. And the other one says, well, I had 12. So I'm a better scholar than you because I had 12. Uh, not quite. It could be the one whose work is making an impact is the one who had one publication, but that publication is begin beginning to receive a lot of significance and attention from all over the space. So I now want to introduce you to the games that academics play. And the games that academics play are um, really sometimes a game of quantity to try and measure how much of a contribution we are making by the number the numbers that we are generating. And this has now been debunked and as an issue that needs serious attention to say, we need to be emphasizing that um, we, we must allow people to publish, 
but not be caught up in the numbers game. I, I have my reservations in some of the things around expectations for uh, postdoctoral fellows to say postdoctoral fellows must produce three papers in one academic seating. And I think it's quite difficult sometimes by the nature of the fields that we are in, because some of the fields will require them to have data, analyze the data. By the time that process is finished, um, it, 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 it's, it's a different uh, process. I was laughing to a colleague yesterday, uh, Professor Goon, uh, and I say to Professor Goon, I wish I was more in the natural sciences, because you guys can write an article which is just three, four pages long, and it's published. And so the point, the point is not so much about um, the, the length of the article. The point really should be about what impact is the article making in view of what we are trying to achieve. And that, that's crucial and important. The fourth point, publishing pays, but at what cost? Publishing pays, but at what cost? Uh, some of you will know uh, the work of uh, Professor Kian uh, Tomaselli, who wrote a nice article, which I really enjoyed reading, in the South African Journal of Science, um, which was uh, around the perverse incentives and the political economy of the South African academic journal publishing sphere. And one of the things I take as a direct quote from that um, uh, uh, um, uh, workshop, the South African scientific publishing economy is built on a foundation of clay. This economy distorts research impact and encourages universities and academics to commoditize the output. Now, this is not me, uh, so that I don't get quoted out of context. This is um, a leading scholar um, who um, is doing research or has done uh, 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 some work around the incentivization of um, publishing. So, publishing depending on the context you're in, does pay, but at what cost? We realize this uh, in a very interesting way because there's been a lot of talk around predatory publishing. There's been a lot of talk around uh, people who started uh, publishing uh, in quantities and droves and you know writing to these journals and the incentivization kicking in. And then the system, as, 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 as the word used by Kian uh, Tomaselli here, it's a foundation of clay. Uh, the system really should be prioritizing impact, uh, should be prioritizing um, uh, what we would like to emphasize as making a difference, that power dynamic that I spoke about at the start. This is a conversation that is not going to end. And I know some of us here can take a different opinion around uh, all of this. Um, my, my, my colleagues, sometimes when we're in the spaces like the UK, laugh at uh, me and to say, wow, I would love to work in your particular context where you get incentivized for publishing. And I really am cautious nowadays when I urge people to say, please, 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 I don't want people to get the impression that our system is all about um, the incentivization aspect. Our system is really should be about prioritizing the importance of impact and impact uh, in, the, in the way that we publish. And that's crucial and that's important. Then we also have the ugly side of publishing. The ugly side of publishing. We're trying to build it up to get to the aspects of the impact factor. Johan Morton and colleague uh, Valentine um, uh, wrote a, a piece in the South African Journal of Science again where they were talking about the extent of the South African authored articles in predatory journals and listen to their conclusion. We conclude with some suggestions about predatory publishing and its pervasive consequence for our trust in science and how this should be addressed by the major stakeholders in the system. So what they, we now realize is that, well, some of what we were peddling and uh, pushing as this is what research is saying, um, had been clouded through aspects of predatory practices. And because of that, it brought into doubt, even using the words previously by Kian Tomaselli, the foundations of clay, but using Johan Morton, the issues of trust, the trust that happens in aspects related to science. And so 
and so what what is at stake here is not so much the uh, the, the 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 institutional reputation but what is at stake here is also the reputation of the person who is producing the science quite 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 important number 6 unfortunately publishing also isolates so that's why some people would say why bother why bother to publish when it's going to isolate and this can be done this can be thought of in two ways the first way is to say well i have historically struggled in getting a paper published because the rejection part is not a nice part um i i will do research one day in all the reviews i have received i always struggle with reviewer number two uh, and it's not by uh, that it, it's by some coincidence i guess but reviewer number two is the one who always gives me a hard time. And, they, and so what some people do when they get difficulty in the space of publishing, they then ask themselves the question, why should I bother? Some people who have a lot of potential, who could be going at what, two, three articles a year, would then say, well, the system only requires me to publish one or two. I'll just go at the most minimal because this is a hard piece, of, um, this is hard uh, work anyway. Uh, this paper in the Health Essay uh, Journal um, paints a picture of some of these difficulties of publishing. The need for higher education institutions to develop or strengthen interventions that target research writing. And I think that's crucial. I think that's crucial. The next time we're going to sit uh, as, a, as a department or a, a group of colleagues and we're going to expect honor students to start working on their mini dissertations, we need to ask ourselves the questions. Have we done enough to build the capacity around what is one of the major deterrents to this experience, which is the writing experience? We are expecting wonders and miracles. And I guess reviewers are also expecting wonders and miracles when the challenge could not be the research, but the challenge could actually be the tool in which uh, the research is expressed in, which are these portals and journals that we publish in. So think of it this way. A good community project happening in Alice, uh, which is trying to save water using um, uh, sophisticated technologies. You write it for the journal Rural Economy. You send it to the journal Rural Economy. Rural Economy then responds and says, um, unfortunately, uh, we reject your paper because of A, B, C, and D. It does not take away the impact that is happening on that technology in that rural community. What has simply happened and what is, what is discouraging here is not so much the the rejection, the rejection is based on the paper, not the intervention that was there. And that's where the idea of impact should actually be borne in mind, that if I get rejected and I still think there's a lot, there's good merit in the work that I'm doing, I could find and I should find better ways of expressing it so that at least the work arrives to the particular audience. And I think that is a skill that we need to learn. Uh, so one of the other things, apart from research directing, work-life balance. Um, uh, yesterday at this workshop that Prof Kapingura is talking about, one of our colleagues from social work also shared an experience where she said to me, she has said to some of her friends and said this to say, listen, um, I'm working on an article. And the person responded, the friend responded, you're always working on an article. What are these articles that you're always working on? You know, uh, some form of uh, expression of saying, please explain, you've isolated yourself for too long away from everybody else. Explain uh, what you're trying to do. So publishing also has that work-life balance. In a former life of mine, I would spend even a Sunday in, a, in, a, in the office trying to get, uh, 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 you know, into journals and so forth. Until you also realize that the battle is not so, the journey is not so much about working long, it's also about working smart and collaboration also helps there. But fundamentally, even in a context where we can say we are far much better than our fellow African countries, funding also remains a concern. The final point, whose voice is really worthy of publishing? Whose voice is really worthy 
of publishing. I want to pause and uh, make the room a little bit uncomfortable this morning by asking some questions. And you can go and reflect around these in the different fields that you publish in. Go and ask yourself some of these questions. Who is really the editor of the journal that I'm sending it to? So the next time you try to write about uh, Ukutwala and all of the other concepts, the Nimbe concept, and you try to bring it to a management journal and the, the editor sees it and says, nah, this is not even going to go past the uh, reviewer's desktop rejection. But I'm trying to write about indigenous, the fusion of indigenous knowledge practices within modern management uh, space. No, 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 no. And so what has just happened there is the bias that one of the papers was talking about. Now, I have a privilege of serving in one or two editorial committees, and that's something that we have tried to also make emphasis on to say let's put in check the decisions that are around some of the publications that are rejected i mean it's disheartening for some people to work on something and all of a sudden it gets rejected and whereas the rejection is largely due to the um lack of understanding of the world views that we operate in let's consider global north global south dynamics I get an email sometimes from journal editors uh, in, in European and uh, American context and saying, we are not receiving a lot of articles from a South African context. Would you consider, or African context, would you consider being a guest editor uh, for an African issue? And I applaud some of our colleagues here, uh, Prof. Simatele, Prof. Kapingura, have, re have just recently edited a, a special issue from the African Journal of Economic Management Sciences, which was trying to also give voice to these African stories, which hardly ever make it. And there's this acknowledgement. But sometimes the problem is when those in the global south, the African countries, are doing less to try and write about their specific situations and uh, localities, whereas they are merely now regurgitating what could have been just be deemed as more of Western ideological thought processes. What is science in localized experiences? What is science to that community that I drive past every morning on my way to work and dropping off the kids, uh, Nompumelelo? What does it mean when I go into that township and I see people in that township uh, and I start to talk about entrepreneurial orientation, effectuation, do they really understand what that is all about? What is it that they understand? How can we tell their stories on a platform in which their stories can also be given the power that they deserve in the context that they're operating? What about the language of science? The language of science predominantly remains English. But does it say something about... Um, our inability to communicate in that language, does then that make our voices uh, inferior because of the inability to express ourselves in the language of science? And those are fundamental questions that we should be asking and thinking around, especially as we seek to put our work out there. And so I then pose a question. Please tell me, and we're going to open it up really, we're still within the time, why are you publishing the work that you are publishing? You can be honest. You can type in the chat box. I will not read the names. If you're brave and you want to just air out your concern, here is the question. Why are you publishing? Any takers on that question? If you've got five or more articles, it's, a, it's an important question because you are publishing. So why are you publishing? Uh, I see a hand. I'm not sure who it is. Uh, Professor Simatele and uh, Vuelwa. Yeah, um, Prof, I published because I think that I need to share my thoughts with people who can bring change. So my research largely is around things that I think can influence somebody to make a change in the life of another person. So I'm a development economist. And what I do, I always try to get 
either the local economic development directors or the municipality or the government somehow the, at the local level to hear what I'm saying about the people I'm researching so that some change can come into their lives. And I think that by publishing that kind of work, other researchers can read it and multiply that effect. So that's largely why I publish. Thank you, Professor Matele. Uh, Huyelwa? Uh, thank you, Prof. Good morning, colleagues. Can you hear me, Prof? Yes, loud and yeah. clear. Okay, thank you. Well, the number one reason um, I've only published like two papers, so I'm still a novice to this, is mainly number one is to contribute to the field of one, academic development where I work in the teaching and learning center, and number two, the industrial psychology. So I also want to contribute to the body of knowledge of how we understand the work that we do and maybe could make a difference then to other people in the same field. Number two, um, it's similar to Professor Matele's uh, sentiments of, I want to share also best practices uh, with other scholars as well as practitioners as well, because um, as much as we are academics, it's also nice when we make recommendations or receive recommendations from the, pract the, the, the practitioners of what we could do then as scholars. So it's also another room for improvement on our side for, you know, when we get recommendations and feedback on the work that we do when we publish and share these knowledge and gain new insights into current trends of research. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Wielwa. Uh, Professor Adu? Yeah, thanks, Prof. I, I have different opinion to why I publish. You know, I came from a background whereby I believe that uh, I may not be able to touch many countries in the world. So one of the reasons why I publish is with the philosophy of the fact that where I could not go, my paper should go there. And with that, it will leave an indelible mark into the life of the reader, that means it will leave an impact into their lives. And apart from that, recently I published just to be professional and uh, to make sure that uh, some I contribute to those scholars who are under my feet, especially the emerging researcher. But the truth of it is that uh, I really believe in that philosophy that uh, where I cannot go, let my paper go there. And perhaps maybe to be famous, uh, professionalism and uh, what have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we welcome also our colleagues from um, University of Kigali. I see Professor Madici has said personal interest. Dr. Matt, who is also a guest, to gain mileage in the academic ladder. Uh, passion and self-expression, Professor Madici. And then Dr. Rungani, candidates ever, sharing new knowledge that can assist in policy development and to have an academic standing, it is also a requirement for promotion. So true, Dr. Rungani. On a more serious note, again, Dr. Matt uh, says, um, I am finding joy in realizing that there are people finding my work worthwhile reading. This means publishing can uh, propagate conversations about development. So true and links very well with what uh, Professor Ardu said. Um, Kaya, Dr. Kaya. Thanks, Prof. Um, I, I'm also in agreement with the um, other speakers, uh, but to add, um, I think because I'm in the community development field, um, I believe that um, the, the indigenous knowledge is still um, sort of overpowered by the Western knowledge. And um, I, I believe when I publish that um, with the hope that actually the, the voice of the, um, the indigenous voice uh, will be heard and, and will start also um, infiltrating in the academic sphere. Thank you. Let me, maybe let me flip it around and say, why are you not publishing? Let's flip it around. Professor Simatele? No, Prof, um, I'll go on. I just wanted to raise two questions before I leave, but no, let, let colleagues um, oh, oh, okay. uh, answer your question. 
Okay, M maybe let's flip it around and I won't read names if this is the case. Let's just ask that question. Why are people not publishing? Why do you think, even if you have one or two papers, as Vuel was said, why would you, what are some of the challenges that are limiting your expression of publishing um, um, uh, with impact, not just with numbers? I guess that's why we're having this workshop. Eh? <laughs> Professor Madici says that um, you're not publishing. You're not an academic if you're not publishing. Um, uh, okay, I, I want to I want to come to the chat box. I think we publish for different reasons on where we are in the academic journey. Um, publishing is hard and it takes so long because there's this element of rejection. Dr. Klaba, thank you. Don't have time. I'm forever busy with other things. Uh, why not publishing? We are sub submitting uh, for publications, but rejections are higher than acceptance. And uh, Ms. Hunter, the fear of rejection and critique. Uh, and then uh, my prof, Prof Badaru, for reporting my research findings, attracting attention. I guess that's why we are publishing. Work overload is a problem in all honesty. Uh, Dr. Towns, finding a niche or gap is, has been very difficult. Okay, we will keep those notes in mind. Uh, the fear of rejection again. Prof. Simatella, you said you needed to leave. So can I give you a platform? We, we continue and hopefully we'll answer some of these questions. I don't know if she's still here. I think she's left. Okay, so th the next part, uh, thank you for all these comments. Uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Boucher, you'll now be happy to see that uh, I have not abandoned my old ways. I want to show you why we publish according to The Simpsons. I'm sure you know The Simpsons. And don't act like you don't know because um, some of the great leading thought processes around studying work behavior has come through The Simpsons. Apu says publishing provides a great deal. Maggie, who's just a little baby, says not a clue yet. Lisa, contributing to science, and that came through in some of our, um, our, our work. Uh, the comic book guy, so when they search for me, they find me. And that also came through to say, realizing that my work is having impact. Ralph, for the curiosity. Smithers, to contribute to others. Marge, it's all in a day's work. It's part of my duty as an academic. And Mr. Burns, to be excellent. But what I like about what you're seeing in this picture is that the reasons why we publish are actually not just motivated by individual aspects, but they're also motivated by the stakeholder aspect, the different stakeholders who we report to or the stakeholders that we are. And I think that's crucial. And I think Dr. Town's question around issues related to um, finding a niche become very important in the next slides that we're going to talk about. Uh, Prof. Simatel, I see you're here. Would you like to come in before we go further? Okay, let's go. Okay, so the core of what we want to talk about, what constitutes a high impact factor or what constitutes a high impact factor. I want to first say to you, what constitutes high impact factor mirrors why we are publishing. And, 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 and in an unfair way, I would also say the process of what constitutes a high impact factor is a subjective process, which is also determined by uh, other stakeholders and things that are happening. Maybe we need a social justice approach to try and understand who came up with this aspect of saying this is high impact factor, this is not. But I believe and entirely am convinced that it's largely driven by subjectivity, how we are taught research, how we are mentored, and the experiences that we go through. And those are crucial, at least for me. So, Elsevier then does something wonderful. They then come up with some pointers. 
and I want to go through these pointers because I think they are, they are crucial in telling a story of what we want to cover. What constitutes subjectivity must all um, subjectivity, um, um, high impact factor must also be seen in the type of uh, preparatory work that you're doing for the particular manuscript. Sometimes work gets rejected because it is not adding anything new to the body of knowledge. And I think that's crucial. And as African scholars, may we not shy away from the pride that we should have of trying to showcase our localized experiences on the platform. And I'm happy to hear the development guys speaking because this is a great opportunity. If someone has found that entrepreneurial orientation is linked to a firm's financial performance, and there's been 60, 80 other papers that have found that, the same thing, and it's widely documented over time. And here you are, you're then writing for a journal like Entrepreneur, Entre, ETP, Entrepreneur Theory and Practice, Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice. The journal editor is likely to reject that particular work, largely because the body of knowledge is not edified in any way or the other through the work that you're doing. And I think sometimes we try to hide using even localized terminologies to say no work has been done in a South African context. This is why this work is significant. So there are multiple things that we must do in terms of um, getting ourselves ready. And one of these things is we must prepare our manuscript as an important cornerstone of the research we are doing. We must be able to identify certain steps and goals in this manuscript preparation process. What are some of the things that you can ask as you're writing that manuscript? Have you done something new? And remember the issue is here is not publishing in any other journal. The issue here is publishing um, in a high impact factor journal. What can we learn here? Is this work new? Is there any challenges in your work? So what do we mean here? We're simply saying, is there a clear challenge that your work is trying to solve? And are your results going to influence other researchers to see things in a certain direction so that we may be able to say we've learned something? And have you provided solutions to this difficult problem as in number two? So if you can answer yes to these questions or some of the above questions, then it's good time to share your research and start preparing your manuscript. Now, what usually happens is that um, students often ask a question, um, Prof, I want to be supervised by you. Okay, uh, so what do you want to focus on? I want to focus on the impact of training on individual and organizational capabilities. Okay, how did you come to choose that? Uh, why is that important? Uh, you know, those are questions that the topic comes first in most instances, rather than the thought process around the why questions of why is this significant and why would this be interesting? And I look forward to some of your engagements and uh, uh, around this when we open up for questions. Make your manuscript publication worthy. I have a friend of mine, every time they are going for an interview, they always say to me, I may not uh, uh, sound a million dollars. I may not have an academic record, which is a million dollars, or a research profile, which is a million dollars, but for the sake I'm going for this interview, I am going to dress a million dollars and look the part. Now, I'm not saying fake it until you make it, but what I'm simply saying is that as you prepare the manuscript, Remember, there's a second work that also must be done. And this is a work of making sure that the manuscript is worthy of publication, that the manuscript deserves the attention of the editor and the reviewers to say, this is something we're going to work with. And these are questions we also should ask. The components of a good manuscript, again, very subjective. But what we learn from these components, that we, if they are there of, 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 sub, uh, of um, a good manuscript, the, cons the, the preparation process would likely lead into the, the next part of the process, the contribution. The contribution is key in positioning what you want to do. High impact journals seek for high quality manuscripts. 
I've had the privilege of also editing and publishing in one or two of these uh, so-called high impact factor journals. And some of the things that I see as basis of rejection, mistakes I have made. I sent uh, an article to a journal, a manuscript to a journal, and uh, the journal has made it very clear in the author guidelines that we use the um, Americanized version, uh, which is the Z, not the S. And here I am spelling the word organization with an S throughout. And the editor wrote back a simple letter, which was a desk rejection, to say, in future, we encourage all submissions to the journal to be in line with the journal requirements and make sure that you read. So what I do nowadays, before I send a manuscript, I, I, I have a little tick box to say, have I read the author guidelines? Have I followed these, these issues that uh, the, the journal has in place? So high impact journals seek for high quality. They not only quality in terms of how it is written, but quality in terms of the contribution to the knowledge of the reader. But also quality in terms of how it communicates to um, the results and the impact of the results. These questions, these questions, very crucial. Here are some important characteristics of a good ma manuscript. A clear scientific message. The manuscript contains a message that is clear, useful, and exciting. Again, very subjective terms, because somebody would say, Prof, what does exciting mean? Does exciting mean that I have to put emoticons in my paper to make it be seen as uh, interesting? Exciting sometimes could actually mean playing into the, the gallery of what that paper will be about. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we wrote a paper for a journal called Education and Training, which is quite a good journal and um, in, in the field. And so the initial paper was around aspects related to employability and labor market integration. And so uh, a, a, a normal thing would be an exploratory study into the labor market integration, blah, 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 blah. That was our initial paper. But after going through this webinar with the notes that I'm sharing with you right now, I then started reading through the papers. And I actually noticed that some of the papers in the journal had actually fancy, unique titles. And it so happened, I kid you not, Professor Celius, I was at 2 a.m. writing a paper, and I was listening to the group U2. And U2 has a song called Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. And I thought to myself, oh, wow, that's exactly what some of the themes that are emerging from this data is about. It's about the challenges about uh, people, labor market system and their continual search uh, in trying to uh, 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 navigate through these challenges. And we then changed the title of that paper to Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For labor market integration, so forth. And, and, and I think it was also a nice way uh, in fulfilling the exciting part. Now, I'm not saying you do it with every journal, but you must have a feel of what that journal is about. And so a good manuscript conveys what you as the author are thinking in a logical manner. The ideas are not disjointed. The reader arrives almost to the same conclusion as the author. Now, if you can do that at your first attempt, attempt, then you are amazing. This is then why we have, um, you know, sent back to the author to make changes. The idea is to, to try to be in sync with the range of um, stakeholders that are there, you as the author and the reader who's likely to be the reviewer of the work that you're doing. Your manuscript format must also be clear. Your manuscript format must also be clear and it must be in a constructed manner that best showcases what you are about and the material that is written in a style that creates, uh, transmits the message clearly. Often rejections are as a result of messages that may not be um, clearly communicated. And the paper is a good paper. The idea is a good idea, but the issue of language plays into a part. Um, Another thing that, um, yes, Professor Madici, thank you. Paper titles need to be catchy so that they also get the attention. And the paper titles differ 
to titles of uh, dissertation. So you must find ways of actually getting that attention. And we teach it in business management, um, the AIDA principle. It must attract attention, generate interest, uh, create a desire, uh, AIDA, and attention, interest, desire, action. Yeah, and the last one is action. It must lead into some form of an action. So we must then make sure that we format the paper into the format. Something so little as indenting the 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 the, the, uh, uh, the, the manuscript. Something so little as the font. They are clear. They only use Calibri twelve point, and you've decided to use uh, Times New Roman. Do according to what the author guidelines stipulate. It also shows that you are adhering to the conventions of that particular um, uh, house. Your title and abstract, we've spoken about this. These are very important and should be succinct, uh, free of obscure abbreviations and to the point. And as Prof. Madici says, it should be catchy and get the attention of the reader. Ensure that your title and abstract do not misrepresent um, um, your research or mislead the reader. We are making changes to um, a, a manuscript that we've sent again with some colleagues from the accounting department. And one of the things I learned from the one of the reviewers was that uh, your keywords, try not to use keywords that are in the title. Use keywords that may be separate to your title. And I didn't know that. And this is something that as you as with each review and with each um, journal house, you know, their specific requirements assist you in understanding what that is about. Ultimately, what is your story? What is it that you want to convey? Find a simple and concise way to tell your story. And I think this is often difficult when students are doing PhDs and masters and they try to write a chunk of their work into one manuscript. So ensure that there's a logical layout of arguments. I always say to first time writers, just do um, a flow of ideas um, where you write down what is it that you want, then what happens. And then once you've got a one page outline of what you want to do, it also helps in terms of uh, making the point. But the last point there, don't forget to make use of summary statements. Summary statements are usually hanging right at the end of whatever critique that you've done as a way of not just reminding the reader, but actually building up a logical argument. So if my son wants to ask me for money, he's not going to simply ask me for money. Oh, he could do that. But he, he builds it up nicely. He first tells me, how was your day? My day was good. So what happened today? Oh, what, how was your day? My day was good. This then happened. You know, the conversation starts to build in. And as the conversation is building in, um, tomorrow we are actually going to Python Park as a class. And uh, um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, then the logical argument of what he wants to achieve. So the point is make sure that you don't leave statements hanging and make sure you are able to put evaluative summaries to be able to, to assist your work. Then this is something I've always underestimated until um, I've started seeing some results to it. You know, when you submit a manuscript, there's always a section where they say, write uh, a cover letter to the editor. And then I realized, ah, you know, what are you writing? And in most cases, what I write there, I summarize <laughs> to the editor what my paper, not what my paper is about, but the contents of my paper. How many words do I have? Um, how many tables do I have? How many figures do I have? But actually at this webinar, we were being trained. They actually said, just write it good cover letter. Start your letter by stating why you think the paper is a good fit for this journal. And your reasons must not be uh, cosmetic reasons. There must be real reasons that are linked to what you have covered. You can't say uh, this paper is a good paper because it's coming from a scholar from a historically disadvantaged institution. Uh, not quite. This paper is a good paper because it emphasizes the, and places priority on the importance of imperatives such as the sustainable development goals. 
Basically, the paper shows uh, the combination of goals, number eight, which is the goal on decent work and economic growth, and how this affects livelihoods in rural communities. So when you do that, you're actually, you know, a part of impression management. You're letting the editor kind of see the value of what you want to include. Now, this is not a guarantee that your paper will be published, but what it simply does, it helps you to be able to also convey. You can even do it uh, for some journals which, who don't ask you for this, but you can actually do it to say, as I write this paper, I want to write a letter to an editor, and then that will actually help you and show you where you need to improve the paper. Include additional background information relevant, but does not fit in your abstract. Focus on answering why you think the paper is good. Inform the audience if there is a controversy or competition they should know about. Do not include the abstract. It's not a, a, a cut and paste of what is in the paper. It's a letter. Uh, and we don't write those a lot these days. But um, it's a letter of saying, this is why I think this work is should be given the attention it deserves. One of the things that lets uh, us down in publishing in impact with impact is the results section. The results section is often um, um, missing certain key information and detail. Uh, it's often um, weak. Sometimes it makes arguments which are uh, not clearly visible with evidence. So work on the results section. And the results section should be clear. It should be easy to understand. We should use paragraph headings to describe the concrete findings uh, of this. And this is particularly true with our qualitative friends when you're writing, um, quality, uh, reporting on qualitative results. And tie together your results with the discussion and make sure that you are reporting on results you're discussing on results that have been presented. Sometimes uh, because people have um, you know, had a huge chunk of work, they try to reduce it. They then omit certain things. So you omitted the orientation variable, but your results section is still talking about the orientation variables. Please pay attention to the references. Um, remember, I said uh, my interpretation, it's about impression management. So if I'm writing a paper, uh, say to the Journal of Management uh, Studies or um, uh, International Business Review or the African Journal of Management, I, I go and download some articles in that journal. Number one for, for reason, I need to also see how others have laid their argumentation. But number two, to also locate a conversation that is happening within the stream that I'm writing on and how it is the stream uh, conversation that is recognized and acknowledged in the particular journal that I'm seeking to write. So cite the main scientific publications of the work that is uh, that you want to work on. Try to not use too many references and try also not to use too few references. So the balance is needed there. Ensure you also understand what material you're referencing and keep self citations to a minimum. Uh, the idea of saying, well, if the currency is um, uh, citations. I've written a paper. I'm going to cite 10 of my studies that I've done, and that will help increase my citations. In some cases, uh, there's also talk of this being some form of um, dishonest behavior. Uh, and also, in some cases, some people actually uh, shun uh, against such practices, or this is not even considered. Uh, as, as acceptable, especially when you're dealing with different people. So please, please make sure that you also keep these to a minimum. You can, one or two, to say this is a continuing work linked to this, but just try and avoid it. I avoid excessive citations of publications from the same region, particularly in journals that are argued to be international journals. Try and show the flair and the significance of looking at it from different regions. And acknowledge also your funders and supervisors to your work. Finally, what can you do after this? Number one, I'm about to end and then we open it up for questions. Work on your digital presence. Ask yourself a question. Do I have an ORCID account? And no, getting an ORCID account is not a way of giving the government your information. But ask yourself those questions. Do I have a ResearchGate account? Is my work 
am I publishing in a journal where a DOI is, 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 is generated? Because that's where the currency comes from, for people to know what you're, what you're doing. So work on your digital presence. Number two, try and insist on quality rather than quantity. This is a big issue, particularly in our context. I still use the example of the two academics who made it the printer. I think the idea here should be to try and encourage uh, colleagues to get skills like the ones that we are imparting today to be able to know what impact is all about and then try and emphasize that it's not so much about you could have 10 articles in journals we don't know uh, and still not get a citation but you could have one or two articles in very credible journals where people, policymakers are arriving at conclusions of working with those journals and it's helping you get ahead. So insist on quality rather than quantity. Be careful of predatory journals. I think every week I get an email um, from praising me for writing a certain paper and uh, we are short of one paper to a special issue that we are working on. Please, could you consider publishing a paper? Uh, you also get others who write and say, um, based on your expertise, we would like you to contribute to this paper. We guarantee you that in two weeks' time, the, the paper will be published. And I'll show you some of the pointers and tips around identifying those predatory journals. Understand the metrics. I think, uh, colleagues, we will need an entire workshop in explaining those metrics around research. What is an impact factor? What does that 1.10 that is um, next to a journal name mean? Um, and how does it... Um, let's mute someone here. Uh, ooh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what do those metrics mean? How does how do I improve my research gate metrics? Um, um, what is a citation? How does a citation affect the work that I do? So let's let's also understand the metrics of what we do. But I think also links to the digital presence. That's going to help us understand the metrics. I think I've misplaced my numbering. Do some research about the journal that you're publishing in. Um, the journal becomes important because it also tells you where your work is going. Um, and also you can actually see where the conversations are going. And then some journal example. Uh, I always like to look for uh, credible publishing houses. Um, and I think publishing is a business now. So you have uh, publishing spaces that are coming up each and every day. I would recommend, depending on your field, for you to look through uh, Emeralds or Savia. Taylor and Francis, Rutledge, um, even Wiley, those are good publishing houses uh, because that reputation also is important because um, it, it, it really should assist in terms of the places where our work is located. So do your homework, find out more about the stable where you want to publish. Number two, please join academic and professional associations. I'm a member of the African Academy of Management, the British Academy of Management and the SABP. What I find when I join uh, special interest groups, um, I get to learn a lot. Special call for papers are, are sent through. You are interacting with people who are publishing in your field. They then help you to actually pick uh, some of the areas that you need to work on. Join professional associations and it's also good for promotion, I guess because it, it shows us and tells us, um, um, you know, your credibility in joining um, 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 uh, these, these professional associations uh, and also the interactions and the fellowship that you have with these colleagues. Consult uh, the accredited list of journals in a South African context. Our 2022 list has been published. Um, we can make available for our non-South African audience when we send the slides for the workshop, uh, the link so that you could also have, but generally it would cover uh, your popular titles, the Australian list and the uh, Arts and Humanities Citation Index. So there's a lot of uh, scopus is there. There's a lot of latitude and freeway in terms of the type of journals that you can work with. 
uh, and we can make those available. That ends my part, and I thank you for attending. If you drop your email in the chat box, uh, we will be able to send you the slides, including the readings that we used today and all other resources that we have been referring to. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof, for such a informative presentation. I'm sure everyone uh, who is connected here is uh, learned something here yeah, as far as publication in high impact journals is concerned and general about the importance of publication. Uh, I will open up maybe in case there are some who have got uh, questions or comments. Uh, you can uh, indicate by raising your hand and I will observe you. Uh, yes, Prof. Sirius? Thank you very much for the informative uh, presentation, uh, Prof. Willie. Uh, my question is just the okay. In the past, we were told um, the the journals need to be on the DHET list, and we that became our our bible that we lived or died by. Um, <laughs> if the journal wasn't on the list, then we didn't publish there. Um, but now there's a new I want to say directive um, that is cropped up in the last maybe year, year and a half, uh, where people talk about the quartiles of the of the journals that you should be publishing um, in, a, in a journal that has a good ranking or that is in quartile one or two or etc. Um, can, can you perhaps tell us more about this just to keep that in the back of our minds when we make the choice of which journals we um, should be publishing in? Okay, thanks, 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 uh, Prof. Silius. I, I, I think yes. I, I, I think I'm going to mute you, Prof. There's some echo coming through. Oh, there's somebody with the. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, I, I think yes. I think, I think w what I've picked up, Prof, is that the, uh, the, the space is evolving. Um. And as the space evolves, one of the things that I want to be cautious about is um, to not let a, a, a subjective viewpoint of someone or an organization or whatever be framed as something set in stone and standard practice for everyone. I have heard of that um, uh, quartile argument. Um, I've also heard of another argument to say, please try and also make sure that your journals are not in the your, your journals your manuscripts are not in the same journals consistently um i have also i mean there's also the aspect of when you are in editorship positions make sure you don't publish a lot of articles where you are editor in um in the same journals and so forth but i think what what it boils down to are those first two points that um uh, we spoke about uh, the first being um, the knowledge about where, what you, your work is about. And number two, the selection of the right journal that you want to. And I think the, 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 the ironing part for me comes through when we attend conferences and meet colleagues and scholars. It's not just about saying your paper has been published. It's about also realizing where has my paper been published? And what is the implication of this place where the paper has been published? And I think that uh, history should be borne in mind as we work and prepare our work. I know some people who have a strategy of saying, um, I have my best paper and I have a little research I do on the side, which is not so much around I wouldn't, it's an honors project, they would say. I'll send an honors project to a low key journal. And, you know, th th those things are things I'm trying to also change in my thinking to say, well, maybe let me rather aim for the best in terms of framing the idea so that I don't struggle to publish a particular paper uh, in, in its argument around. Uh, I must find a suitable place for it. So I'm also still researching on that aspect, but I just draw caution from the fact that the field is evolving. And if the field is evolving, we must also allow for space of um, learning 
from the changes that are happening. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, uh, I see there are two hands here. We have uh, Zamokule. Please pardon me. I'm not, uh, I don't see the title there. Then there is Prof. Adu. Uh, then I'll also read the, another question later. Maybe let's give to these two for now. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, for me, I just have a, a small question. I just wanted to, to, to get clarity on what a predatory journal might be. Okay, I will also open it up to the floor. Uh, iron sharpens iron. Uh, colleagues, uh, a question has been asked. What is a predatory journal? Uh, I, 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 Prof. Madichi from uh, University of Kigali. Uh, thank you, Prof. Willy. Um, a predatory journal is a journal that lacks credibility. A journal that makes promises that are too good to be true. Uh, a journal that probably wants you to pay to publish within two weeks, and a journal that breaks all the rules as, long, as far as ethics of research is concerned. I don't know if that sums it up. Thank you. In addition to that, you know, a, a, a journal that is uh, deceptive in nature is predatory journal. In addition to what uh, Prof. Kingali said, you know, there are a lot of uh, like uh, unsolicited uh, emails we do receive, like the like professor, she, uh, the, the facilitator has just alluded to, the uh, unsolicited uh, email received concerning uh, we lack one paper, do this, do that, do that. Obviously, those are part of a pediatric journals. And apparently there is a, there is a dynamics around these colleagues, you know, Take for instance, if you are floating a journal in a university, before the journal can be approved by the Department of Education and Training, it's expected for you to have different volumes, maybe volume one, volume two, before you navigate to the DHET. And don't think at that stage, some, some unsolicited email flows so that you'll be able to meet the number of paper per volume and I was even told that um, you must you must have uh, all those who will subscribe to those volumes before being uh, approved as accredited journal. We subscribe free of charge, and all these things really baffles ones when you look at different uh, scenario concerning pediatry journal concerning this. So I want to flag that here that uh, if that is true. Don't you think we will continue to receive many unsolicited emails concerning subscribing our manuscript to their journal because some want to have many volumes before they get to another level of being uh, accepted? That is a question. So actually why I raised my hand was to allude to what uh, the speaker said concerning um, the question raised by Professor Celia. You know, different quarters you are hearing on Taiwan, two, three, four, I impart this and that. I just want to corroborate what uh, Prof said that you have really spot on on the answer to Professor Celia. You know, different field with different uh, types of uh, research we are doing. And you know, some people with their own part of research, they think that's the same research you are doing and they intend to force what is happening in their field on the others, which is quite unprofessional, which is quite unethical. You see, these are the things we are saying. And it's good to have this type of a workshop to serve as a limelight or eye opener to see that, okay, when we are talking about eye impact factor journal, there are a lot of variables or factors responsible for that, as you have just told us now. But when you see some people at different quarters making big noise over this issue, and uh, you'll be wondering, you'll be wondering which journal did they publish in. 
Virtually every journal sent to you will tell you that zero point so 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 two point so 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 are impact journal. Which one can we verify? So these are the things that you really need to address here. Professor Shiamuridi, maybe you can assist in that. But I'm glad to, I really, I really suspended every other meeting to say, okay, let me really attend to this, uh, this workshop. Let me really attend this workshop to see what people are saying everywhere. You can see that you, are, you have many questions than answer. You are more confused when people are just saying from everywhere, saying some things from everywhere. And not everything you search for in the Google or whatever is, is actually the truth. So we really need to know where we belong to. We really need to follow all those steps you have just uh, shared with us this morning to know that, okay, this is the reason why I can say the journal is high impact or not. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Prof. Adu. Um, I, I think you're totally right. I want to do something. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm so glad Fortier, Fortier now has a spam filter that um, that assists in um, you know not allowing certain emails to come to 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 you. Uh, beautiful. Okay, right. I, I, I'm 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 making myself vulnerable here. So let's let's see how this is going to work because I've got two devices. I want to show the colleagues something that I think will um, will assist. Uh, so then we do this, then I go to the screen and then I say share. Yeah, here's a, here's a good sign of, um, of, uh, yeah, what's happening. This is my, my spam for Gmail. You see the, you can just see the contents of the, the messaging that are there. There, there is a casino based Best Casino, McCafe, uh, Sports King. There's this one here, though, which is interesting. Research Journal. So I'm going to open it. And again, Google is actually picking it up. Why is this message in spam? Well, okay. Uh, look at the email. DSA Mum, AI publication. Submit the manuscript for publication in a peer-reviewed referred journal. Decisions will be made rapidly as possible. And the journal strive to return reviewers' comments to authors within one week. All the published papers will be assigned a unique DOI and indexed in Google Scholar. For the details, uh, they've put the details there. Look at the area that they are publishing. AI contains different magazines, which are in the arts, humanities, English language. Contact the email, uh, the email address of the person. Uh, you can just see it's a Gmail. There is a WhatsApp number. I mean, those are things, colleagues, that uh, should also be raising questions. Let's look at another one. Um, this is another one. Again, flagged as spam. Um, International Journal Joint Polish Swedish Publication Service. You are called to invite your manuscript. You see the publication there. Would appreciate if you could share. You see, they also want me to do some. Uh, uh, work for them in terms of what can be done. And some of these, unfortunately, I must also say, are on... Oh, it gets graphic now, you see? <laughs> yeah, this is... this is Yeah. yeah. Uh, look at this one. Please note our special call for issues. I would like to let you know that our esteemed journal, Agroscientia, is a peer-reviewed international periodical published by the Self-Finance Independent of Mexico. The new, you know, so the idea which has been expressed here, I mean, look at this. Papers will be sent, should not be submitted elsewhere. All papers will be double-reviewed, two to three expert reviews in two weeks. Colleagues, I'll be very honest with you. I get reviews from even credible journals, and in most cases, I'm always late with my submissions because within two weeks they are, they've, they've managed to get people who will be able to uh, uh, look and, uh, and, and publish through the work. So what are we saying here? What we are saying is let us understand that publishing is also a business. There are people who are trying to make money 
out of the work that you're trying to do. And because they are trying to make money out of the work that you're trying to do, you must also be vigilant. It is not just about rushing to say, I have 10 papers. It's about quality, knowing that the science behind the, 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 the work that you have done has been scrutinized in a way that is not only uh, scientific, but in a way that also gives you that ample feedback to improve your work uh, further. Uh, thank you, Prof. <clears throat> there are two two questions. Yes, yeah, see, we are running out of time. Uh, one is from uh, Dr. Kaba. Which one would you say is better and more respectable between a book chapter publication and a journal publication? Then the second question is uh, from Dr. Uh, Rungani. <clears throat> uh, she says, yeah, Another thing is how to deal with the output in previously accredited journals, which became predatory. Uh, then, he, yeah, maybe Prof, you can respond to those two. Then we'll take the last question now from Prof, uh, uh, Prof, uh, Prof Madichi. Then uh, uh, we'll close. Maybe let me also, I, I don't want to say I'm the only one responding. So if any of the colleagues would like to respond, um, I can respond about the previously, previous journals that were, uh, that have now been classified as predatory. Um, I think the, 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 the there's been, it, the DHET list when it comes out, it also has, um, uh, places where it says removed from the list, it will show you the name of the journals. I know in some circles what they do, NRF funding, they discourage people to put those journals on the on their CVs, be it on the digital CV or also on their actual actual CV. Uh, the second one is some universities I hear uh, 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 also um, allow for some form of um, consideration to say, okay, when was this on the list? And I think it's crucial when you look at the DHET list to also look when those were removed on the on the on on that list. But I think that's a, a workshop we can also do entirely on that list to say what constitutes um, uh, the DHET list. And then there was the question about the books. Um, I, I'm not sure if uh, Prof. Simatella is here because she would help with that one. Um, the books and or any of the um, uh, uh, senior guys who deal with that one. Uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Willie, uh, uh, here. can I chip in on that one? Go ahead, <laughs> Prof. Right. Um, that's a very valid question because um, and management need to understand that. Um, executive management at universities and promotions partners need to actually seriously understand that. Uh, journals, uh, peer-reviewed uh, refereed journals tend to count or have a higher weighting when it comes to assessments of research, research um, assessments. However, it's advisable to have a mixture of book chapters, possibly edited books or books, even case studies in, 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 in reputable uh, publishing outlets to supplement or complement uh, research uh, papers in, 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 uh, in journals. So it's good to have a mix and match and a very good balance. Although most institutions tend to give a higher weighting to peer-reviewed journal articles compared with book chapters, it's always a good idea to have a mixture uh, of some sort. That's my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Madichi. Uh, Prof. Kapingura was there. Any other one? Or Prof. Silias? Um, yes, I just wanted to, to say the same, that it's good to have a mixture. And as you progress and become specialized in your area um, that you profess in, your, your, or that you do your research in, um, book chapters can help help you to show that specialization um, that you have written book chapters on healthcare or e-health or whatever your your focus area is but just to mention as well that there are we call them vanity publishers um, in for book chapters as well that will write to you and say 
um, please, uh, you know, um, think about changing this paper into a book chapter or um, do you want to contribute to this book that will be um, edited by these people? But when you go and look at the actual publishing house, um, it's you know, like they, yeah, it's not a very um, uh, credible publishing house. Um, that's why we call them vanity um, uh, publishers. And your work, you're going to put in all this work and it's never really going to be distributed because they expect you to, to kind of buy the copies of this book and distribute them to your friends, that type of uh, scenario. So just make sure that um, if you do want to go the book chapter route, um, that it is a credible uh, publisher and uh, uh, that the other researchers that's attached to the project are um, credible and you know, have a good reputation in your field. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Silius. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Professor Madichi, uh, was it a question or you wanted to contribute to this uh, uh, question? I remember seeing your hand earlier. Oh, I, I no longer see him. Okay, uh, colleagues, I see that uh, we have gone past uh, the time which uh, the uh, session was supposed to end. Let me leave this time to our Dean Prof. Silias uh, for photo of things. Thank you, Prof. Kapungura. Um, I think, first of all, we need to, to thank our um, presenter, Prof. Tuna Marundi, for a, a well-received and well-thought-out presentation. Um, we are always look forward to, to your presentations, Prof., because I also learn from them, um, which is always nice, and, and yeah, we can learn from each other as well. So thank you so much for, for taking the, the time um, when, whenever we call on you. <laughs> I think uh, we, we abuse you sometimes um, because we know that you are capable and that we can rely on you to provide us with a really informative presentation. So thank you so much for taking the time and being willing to share your knowledge and give back um, from your experience as a researcher as well. Uh, then I want to thank Prof. Kapungura, uh, Deputy Dean of Research, for putting the, the workshop together for us, uh, distributing the call and making sure that, uh, especially in our, at our university, uh, everyone was aware of the workshop. And then I want to thank our guests from the other faculties and from outside. I, I did see that we had quite a few guests from Africa. Um, we didn't welcome you at the start of the workshop, but you are very, very welcome um, at the University of Forte. And uh, yeah, please uh, collaborate. Please find your, your network. We're always wanting uh, to reach out and, and find research partners, people that we can work and learn from. Um, so you're welcome to contact Prof. Chinna Marundi or myself or, or Prof. Kopangura to if you have a research project in mind um, to find you someone or to point you in the right direction of who in the faculty can work with you. Uh, so welcome to you and thank you for joining um, our, our workshop today. Um, I think that was it, unless I'm forgetting anyone. Um, over to you, Prof. Kapungura. Uh, thank you so much, Dean. Uh, I think uh, we've uh, thanked everyone, uh, also including Prof. Adu. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, colleagues. Thank you, Prof. Uh, we greatly appreciate um, uh, you joining us for this. Uh, we hope that we will have further sessions to come and we'll communicate in advance. Uh, we've come to the end of our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof.